we do start talking to these companies earlier and we start looking and using our tools actually. You know, once you have four, five quarters of growth under your belt, that's where our tools would work best right. or better. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by J Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley in partnership with Leomitech, sponsored by Homeward Ventures, Hippo Insurance, Upwest Labs, Synergy Global, Hillel at Stanford, Leap, Birthright Excel, Serona Partners, and in media partnership with C-Tech. Welcome to another episode of 20 Minute Leaders. Today, I'm honored to be here with my friend, Guy Horowitz. Guy is a partner at DTCP in the growth equity team in Silicon Valley. Guy led DTCP's investments in replay technologies acquired by Intel, Fireglass acquired by Symantec, and Dynamic Yield acquired by McDonald's. He also led DTCP's investments in SafeBreach, MorpheSec, AppsFlyer, and Perimeter X, and represents it as a board member and observer. Guy Horowitz, welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. How are you? Not too bad. I'm in New York City. I mean, we're not in New York City. We're in the Empire State Building Empire State right now. Uh, this is such a pleasure to have you here. I've been such a big fan of your work, not of your investments, although they're incredible investments. I've been a fan of your, of your music work oh, wow. and your songs. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about your band, and I want to understand a little bit about what you do in Silicon Valley just besides investments and then connecting it to the daily work, but also your ability to translate your thoughts uh, about the world, about the things that are happening in the context into music in a way that thousands of people truly enjoy listening and, and engaging with it. I think that's, that's a, a beautiful thing. So thank you for entertaining me and for enriching my life over the last year and a half during the pandemic. And uh, Guy, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. So uh, born and raised in Israel, um, spent a few years here in the U.S., actually across the bridge in New Jersey, which helped shape who I am. I went back to do military service in Israel like many Israelis do. Um, and my dream and my uh, ambition was to come back here and do business. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, life uh, uh, decided for me that I was going to stay in Israel. So I helped build a few companies, startups back in the 90s. I'm older than you think. Um, and uh, yeah, then went on to- You built startups in the 90s, he said? Yeah, so I was part of a startup back in 98. It was doing basically like a WhatsApp before WhatsApp. Firstly, the apps world did not exist at the time. So we, uh, we had to sell to carriers. Wow. And if there's anything I learned over my uh, history and my career is that you don't want to work with carriers. So I only worked with them and for them for about 10 years of my life. Um, because I, I learned fast. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, 2004 joined uh, a great VC in Israel called Gemini uh, and spent quite a few years there. Um, a during, legend. Uh, Gemini is now a legend. At the time, it was not as obvious as it is right now. In the hindsight, it's 2020 or 2021. Yeah. So um, uh, we spent a few years helping companies get to the next stage. I actually you know, rolled up my sleeves, as they say, or whatever the right term is and joined a few of our own portfolio companies in different uh, executive roles, which was great. Uh, also worked for Microsoft for a short bit. Take me just one second in the 90s when you're, when you're in the tech ecosystem. What, it was, it, for me, it's trivial, you know, 2021, I'm 25 years old. That's my life. This is what's around me. This is what's sexy. Is it, is it the same feeling that it was in the 90s? There was something pioneering. And again, that's, that's a weird thing. My dad was in high tech in the seventies, right? So wow. yeah, but for me, uh, started college school in 92, we had computers all over and I went to do military service where we had zero computers, only and binoculars. So I felt 96, I felt like I missed the train, right? Wow. I was back in tech or, you know, back in the world and everyone was already kind of literate and I was illiterate. So for me, it was kind of a catch up race. And I think everyone felt this thing is going to change the world, but not necessarily in the same way we think of, of it today, right? It's going to change our lives as individuals, not necessarily how companies do business. So it took a while before we realized my, my first startup, we did a direct to consumer uh, e-learning thing, wow. G, like a GMAT prep. And we ended up selling that to a B2B type entity that was selling this to businesses. So the world took this shift towards B2B and I was just there at the right time. Um, but again, uh, I didn't feel like we we're doing anything super significant. I was just having a lot of fun traveling, trotting the globe, what have you. Um, so, you know, year 2012, I was offered to run a, a local 
outspot our outpost for uh, a German company called Deutsche Telekom. I heard a little bit about them. Yeah, they're tiny, it's kind small. of own T-Mobile and <laughs> such, right? Um, so again, that was great because I could run a local shop. We had R and D, we had business development, we had a little bit of venturing going. I was frustrated as anyone doing ventures with or for a corporate would be frustrated, uh, expressed those frustrations to the CEO of the company of Deutsche Telekom. And just fortunately, someone else in the organization was thinking along the same lines. We ended up, you know, doing this thing called DTCP, which started as a single LP fund. Now it's a multi LP fund, but it's completely the opposite of what a corporate venture is or how you think of it, right? Incredible. We want to make money. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so now you're investing in some of the, some of the most brilliant startups, uh, some of which I've, uh, some of my best friends work at. Wow. And, uh, and, and it's really, really great to see. And you're in the growth scene. Uh, and so, you know, incredible time to, to do investments. But before we get into the investment side of what you do with DTCP, tell me a little bit about a hobby that you know you've really, I think you know it, it, you, it's very engaging for me as a sort as a consumer to to engage with your work, uh, you know, as an artist and as a musician, uh, and it's very inspiring for me also to see people that are that are so heavily involved in the tech ecosystem. You're sitting on the boards of some of the fastest growing companies, and so I know how busy that gets. Yet you make sure to put in. Uh, you know, time to, f- to fulfill, you know, your inner passions. Tell me a little bit about that. Right. So first it's an outlet, right? For everyone working tech or working venture, you need to have something that's not just that race and especially growth stage. And we're in sales, basically we're selling our money to entrepreneurs who are doing super well. Someone else might offer them that same money for even cheaper. So we need to kind of, you know, relax and, <laughs> and uh, wind down, think of the future, but also what we do. I mean, I'm in a band in Silicon Valley, right? Yeah. And it's crazy because it's an Israeli band. We're all kind of tech people and venture. So, you know, very specific types of people who gather in on Sundays to do rock. And we do, we cover, right? We don't do our own music. And if I think of it and connect it to my world of venturing, it's actually the product market fit for covers, especially Israeli covers in Silicon Valley. Yeah. is so much better than my own music, kind of my own you know, uh, uh, which I, I like, but no one else would want to listen to, right? So we found this thing people want to listen to. There are not too many rock people in Silicon Valley singing in Hebrew. So uh, doing that actually allows me to enjoy kind of being suddenly, you know, even as a VC, I'm chasing companies and trying to shove my money. Uh, now they're actually coming to my concerts, our concerts and, and listening. That, that's awesome. And I think also shows that, you know, I could be an amazing singer songwriter. I'm not, but had I been a great one, uh, people would have paid top dollar to, to see me and buy my records. Right. But in reality, there are many such people who do not get to the prime time, do not become unicorns or decacorns of music. Right. So sometimes product market fit is as important, if not more important than being this brilliant kind of singular. You know, right. Snowflake. A hundred percent. And so tell me a little bit about that, that, that sense of fulfillment. Cause I think that it's an interesting, for me, it sounds like you're, you're, you know, you're practicing as an investor in the day to day, but then you're also an entrepreneur within, you know, in, with, in terms of the music and you're experiencing what it's like to reach that product market fit and to create a product that people truly enjoy, not just chasing this sort of deep technology, create your own music for, for, for years or decades without people really engaging with it. Right. Right. So I think it's a, it's a matter of balance. I mean, first, you know, there's a day job and you got to put your effort into that. Um, but there's also a, uh, let's call it a mix. You got to have this mix of passion and something that comes from the soul and enters the soul rather than just the monetary side. And I think that's true for every startup, for every business, definitely in venture capital. You got to have this mix, you got to have this balance. Um, and for me personally, I mean, COVID, you know, and, and everything that happened since was also a revelation because you know, there's Facebook and other social media where you can actually get to people, not necessarily through that, you know, I want to sell tickets or sell, you know, uh, records or whatever the, the unit of measure is for music nowadays, right? Singles. Uh, it's actually through people discovering you, you know, things being kind of made viral through WhatsApp and whatnot and getting those calls and those messages from people is actually almost as satisfying and gratifying, especially if you have a day job that pays well. I mean, if you need to make your money from music, Good luck with that. But if you are able to support yourself and then get all this positive feedback on an individual basis, you know, kind of Michael writing me a text, that's way better than anything else. So I think having that in your world 
would be highly recommended for anyone who's doing anything intense. Well, I have to say that uh, you know you're you're a rock star in our in our world, like just from the music and I, and for me, you know, I, I got to do it. I got to do episodes with a lot of investors and a lot of entrepreneurs. I am truly excited seeing you. I feel like I'm talking to a celebrity because I I'm sitting and I and I just love the work that you're doing on on the music side. And all of a sudden, in preparation for this, I'm looking at the incredible investments that you've made and and the boards that you sit at and and the way that you think through the investments and the thesis of of DTCP. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. And and it still dawns on me that what I still truly care about is the is is the musician part of you. Tell me a little bit about DTCP. You're sitting on some great boards. What, how do you sort of reason through uh, the, you know, the investment world today? Okay, so a lot has changed. We started in 2015, you know, our thesis was always enterprise SaaS. We started with OmniStage and gradually kind of gravitated towards the later stages. I still, you know, remember fondly the days where we could invest in companies that had no revenue. I think now those days are gone. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, but the world has also gone, you know, in, into a different direction than we thought. I mean, some companies we thought of as, hey, great ideas that are doing okay and they're going to do better because, you know, companies that have great um, uh, units of measure, great KPIs, you know, that, that, that meet the, kind of the top greatest uh, criteria out there are actually going to outperform everyone. And as investors, we want to be there. So you look at our portfolio today, we're very KPI driven and metrics driven. And we have, we've built a, a tool and an analysis platform that allows us to basically select the top of the crop and go after those. Statistically speaking, we're not going to be able to invest in, into each and every one of them, right? But if we are able to invest into one of those, it's going to do so much better than your typical average OK plus company that we just have to focus on those. So our platform... And how early, how early do you do that for? So obviously, you know, companies are, are moving very, very fast today, right? And they're, and they're raising round after round. But how early do you go, both in terms of making the relationship with the person so that they would want to partner with you, it's a two-way street, but also in terms of you be having enough time to actually analyze and see, okay, what is actually happening here? Right. So, you know, we started and we gravitated very quickly towards the leader. What happened is that it's getting harder and we need to start looking earlier like everyone else, right? We do not have the set of tools that allows us to scale well in the three kind of 10 million ARR realm, right? So most of our companies would be in the 10, 15 million ARR and say ARR because focused enterprise SaaS, right? Um, but we do start talking to these companies earlier and we start looking and using our tools actually, you know, that once you have four, five quarters of growth under your belt, that's where our tools would work best right. or better. So how do we work with companies earlier? Uh, we built this like, and again, this might be a VC cliche, but your value creation team is probably the most important team right. in, in your organization because that's a differentiator, right? Yep. That's a secret sauce. So we, and again, product market fit, many of those companies, both in Israel and here in the US, um, are lacking in Europe. They're, they're lacking the ability to know when's the right timing to go into Europe, how, which, you it's know. not really a big part of the conversation today. We're talking all the time about the US market and it's not a big part yet. I was surprised, by the way, also in Europe, when you have a French company, <laughs> you know, we, have, we have a French company called Aircall. They're not as conversant about Germany as you'd think, right? Because, yeah. I mean, everyone sees their own world and the US. So we managed to find this uh, happy place where investors of our own fund, right? Our LPs yeah. and their network and their constituents are our best friends when it comes to taking our companies to the market and helping them kind of lubricate a little bit of the processes that typically take, you know, years and, and, and different languages and different uh, geographies. So we, we help with that. And that's useful even in the early stages, because as you said, many of the young entrepreneurs and the non-young entrepreneurs um, are kind of waking up to that realization that the European market is being neglected, right? right? And many of the CEOs and, and the CROs in their portfolio have not spent much time thinking about Europe. So that's that's how we create and, and manage a conversation in a very early stage, even if we are not investing at that point in time. Right. And the occasional kind of moment where a company is exactly at this transition moment and we're able to invest while they're going to Europe, that's awesome. And that's actually how we've done most of our, our investments. What is the res the initial reception that your founders may have, especially the first time entrepreneurs? This is the first time perhaps that growth investors are are going to either approach them or or start looking at what they're doing. And do you want to build this relationship? Are they receptive to it? Are they hesitant? Are they happy, sad? So obviously not sad, maybe worried. Yeah. So I think first entrepreneurs are created 
uh, in very different ways. I mean, not all of creative course. people, not all of them have the same reception towards different types of messages. But a typical entrepreneur, founder, CEO would probably uh, say, oh, uh, the name rings a bell, sounds familiar. You know, we used to have the Deutsche in the name. Now it's just a D, right? We go by the acronym. Yeah. But still, I think we're, we're still affiliated or associated in people's minds with uh, Germany, which is not bad. And that would actually ring a bell sometimes and you know, ring a bell, not in the uh, IPO sense of things, though it does help. Um, it will r remind people that uh, we are different and that we might be able to uh, bring strategic value. Now, when, when people talk about strategic investment, always kind of, oh, you're a strategic investor, right? What does that actually mean? What does that mean? Okay. So first, who is strategic to whom, right? When you say, are you a strategic investor? Means, are you investing for someone's strategy, like a Deutsche Telekom <laughs> strategy or, you know, size or SK Telekom, sure. right? No, it's the opposite. Think of it as the entrepreneur. Am I strategic to you, right? right. So when you say strategic investment, that's actually great. Right. My strategy is to expand into Europe. You are helping me with that. Hence, you're strategic to me. Right. So kind of, you know, reversing the roles a little bit. Sure. Um, and the other thing is obviously um, uh, money, right? We are able to write bigger and bigger checks. We're raising a new fund. It's going to be a bigger fund. Checks are going to grow. Uh, that's not a consideration for most entrepreneurs, but being able to get get a double digit million check from a strategic investor that helps you with, with something different is unique. In the past, it used to be that the, those smaller, you know, the, those large investors that are strategic would come in with smaller checks, probably don't move the needle, right? So you need to want them a lot. Now we can actually cater to your financial needs and make your rounds, you know, scale sure. with bigger checks and still bring that strategic value that, that you imagine as the entrepreneur. If you're looking at your position within the firm as a partner and you obviously have hands and, and legs in, you know, all, all various, all various positions, especially as you're talking, you know, so intentionally about value creation, the way that you're creating these relationships with, with companies and, do, and being very data driven and trying to be very analytical about it while also being, you know, I'm sure very relationship driven about what's happening. What do you enjoy most? I mean, you're doing, there's so many different things you do. What, what, which part really resonates with Guy Horowitz? Well, so Guy Horowitz, the original Guy Horowitz, uh, not even the musician guy, is a product guy, right? It's a product so, guy. Yeah. So for me, uh, if we offer a product, to the customers, the constituents, which are the startups, uh, that is unique and of high quality and consistently so, we're going to do well, right? So our best ambassadors are our own entrepreneurs and founders. And yeah, the board work is interesting, but I do not imagine a case where I'm the most experienced guy on the board. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years now. There are people with double the gray hair or less hair, but all gray. Um, yeah. And, you know, people that have seen more IPOs and more sure. downturns. I'm learning all the time and I'm improving all the time. That holds true for any of us as, as board members, as, as uh, GPs in the fund. Where we excel is where we bring unique value and that's around that kind of ability to go to market and touch it in a, in a different way. Sure. And that's our product market fit, uh, especially nowadays with, with growth stage companies, right? That's exactly what they need. The next 50 million, that's not gonna come from the super crowded market here in the US. Mm -hmm. So that's what I enjoy the most. That's by the way, where we get the most accolades. So when people talk about us, they don't talk about our great, um, uh, you know, whatever, uh, offsites yeah. or uh, investor meetings, we do great ones as well. But that's like <laughs> anyone else. You know, when we open the door and someone goes through it and, and gets a deal done, that's actually, that resonates. I want you to take me back a long time, before the TCP, uh, before the army even, uh, before Guy the Entrepreneur. You know, middle school, elementary school. You know, you're walking down the street, you're walking in school, what, what interests you? What, ins what, what really sparks your curiosity? Right. So I'm, you know, I'm a, a, a missed architect, right? A I, missed architect. Yeah. Yeah. Or a card designer. I mean, the two things that I would fill my notebooks with, and I was a pretty bored, really bored student in middle school, right? Huh. People who remember me from those days, remember my notebooks being filled with, with wow. uh, yeah, yeah, all sorts of things, right? So cars, um, when I saw Tesla for the first time, I think what year was uh, you know, the Tesla S, right? When the, the concept, what, 12, 13 years ago, I was like... You went back to the notebook and said, like, yeah, that's fine. That's, that's, that's mine. my design. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't even buy the stock the right time. So uh, for me, every, every building, every uh, car, everything that's like a combination of art and science, you know, design, engineering meets art, that, that, that makes me kind of you know, want to do it. Then what better place to do it, this interview from the Empire State Building? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I still remember that, uh, 
you know, movie that I saw as a young kid where I saw the Empire State Building for the first time. It was like such a perfect piece of architecture. I love it. If I would ask any of your partners, any of your band members, any of your entrepreneurs, who is Guy? What words come to mind if they think of Guy Horowitz? What, what do you think they would say? Okay, I'll try to make this uh, interesting. I mean, I can say lots of things that would probably reflect on my, my ego, right? You know, dreamer. I think I'm a dreamer. You know, for me, you know, keeping my dream alive uh, while doing all those things that are the, the brick and yeah. mortar, the bread and butter. I think, you know, dreaming is, is part of who I am or maybe a very big part of who I am. I love it. Guy, Todaraba. I really appreciate it. This is uh, so amazing for me. Uh, I'm, I, I still follow your music. I was listening to your songs on, on my walk here uh, from Times Square and, and I just love your work and, I, and it's just very clever. And, um, and I'm personally inspired by the idea of, of pursuing the passion while also working extremely hard and then finding the ways in which the way we pursue the passion actually intersects with, with, what, with what we're doing in our day to day and, uh, and the way that within DTCP you're thinking about the relationships you're forming with, with the entrepreneurs when it may not be the right time yet, but you're understanding that the, it's going to get there. And then you want to be their value created creation partners and strategic partners. Uh, and obviously with the world uh, opening up and thinking about Europe, I think it's an amazing opportunity. So thank you very much. No, thank you. You might want to turn the camera off because I'm getting emotional now. So thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.